Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today about teaching and learning in the age of AI. And as part of that, I want to introduce to you the National AI Institute for Adult Learning and Online Education. I want to share the main messages right in the beginning, because later I'll get a little bit of the technical depth, and I want to make sure that the main messages are, uh, we are together on that. First, and I think Antonio mentioned this briefly, learning has now become lifelong. Uh, I prefer the term lifetime uh, because it involves not just length but also breadth, but it's the same idea. No longer the province of K-12, no longer the province of colleges and universities. It's now for all of us throughout our lives. Second, AI will have a huge impact. And the key, I think, will be personalization. For the first time, we have access to vast amounts of data on learners and learning. We have never had that access to that, that amount of data, and that will lead to personalization. Third, important to know that AI is not one thing. There is generative AI these days. There's a lot of talk about it. But there's also cognitive AI. There's also statistical AI. There's also uh, Bayesian AI, logical AI. And similarly, data, knowledge, information, they all have to come together. AI is a tool, not magic. There are still problems of learning and education, and we have to use those tools to address the real problems. And finally, although we pay a lot of attention to AI, human-AI interaction is almost as important. In the history of AI, there has often been the case where AI researchers said, we'll build them and they will come, and they never came. And the reason they never came, at least part of the reason they never came, is because these AI tools were very difficult to use. All right. So those are the four major messages, and let me now get on with, with the talk. So this is from a World Economic Forum. It issued its Future of Jobs report just in May, so just a couple of months back. And it says that 44% of workers will need to be reskilled within the next five years. That's a lot of workers. In the United States alone, that means 60 million American workers will need reskilling and upskilling in five years. Not clear how many there are globally, but at least 400 million. What happens to these workers? Well, we have to focus on adult learning. These are workers who are, let's say, 18 to 80 years old, and they have special needs. If we look at the right side of the picture, many of them are, have families, they're married. Many of them have jobs. They are reskilling and upskilling even as they are working. They can't leave their homes and go to a place of education. We have to take education to where they live and work. There's also a huge variation. If you're teaching a class of 30 students in the sixth grade and you're teaching them, say, Spanish, there already is a lot of variation among those 30 students. When you're talking about 30 million people, the amount of variation is huge. No one class will do it. No one teacher will do it. You will really need to personalize it. To individual needs, individual skills, individual preferences. Looking at the left side, when we teach in K-12, we focus on general purpose knowledge. But adults are interested in task-specific skills. K-12, we focus on very well-defined problems, like arithmetic, a single correct answer known in advance. Adults are more interested in ill-defined problems. What will happen to the sea turtles across the state of Georgia as the temperature of water rises by one degree? In K-12, almost all reading, all learning is teacher-guided. But a lot of adult learning that you and I do as adults is self-directed. All right, so what do we do now? Well, one possibility is to go with online education. Online education, in fact, is here and it's here to stay. Because online education is uh, geographically distributed. That means you can take education to where people need it. And it's asynchronous. That means people can use it when they need it. There are 36 million Americans who are registered in at least one online class at present. Globally, more than 220 million. And this is expanded, expected to increase by about 50% over the next five years. 
But here is the difficulty. The quality of online education is very uneven. When it works, it works really well. But it doesn't always work well. But like I said, online education for the first time provides vast amounts of data. There might be a 60-year-old who is learning about AI-enabled welding, for example. And we may have data about what he or she learned and all the skills that they were uh, learned over the, uh, their entire lifetime. Can we not use that data to help them learn AI-enabled welding? We have never had that data previously. One thing to keep in mind here, we're not trying to optimize AI. That's not our goal. We're trying to optimize humans. We're trying to serve humans. We're designing a social technical system, not just designing a technology. This social technical system must serve humans according to human goals and human norms and human values. So a couple of years back, the United States National Foundation, Science Foundation gave us a pretty large, pretty long-term grant to establish a National AI Institute for Online Education and Adult Learning. Uh, this is the vision. We are going to use AI to enhance the proficiency of adult learning and online education. Note the word proficiency. Not efficiency, not effectiveness, not quality, proficiency. That means skill learning for preparation for additional learning or for preparation for workforce. Making it comparable to in-person education. This is an ambitious goal. It's an audacious goal. Many people will say it's impossible. Many people will say you cannot make it comparable to in-person education. And I think we will tend to agree that some aspects of in-person education cannot be replaced by online education. There is a role that teachers have to play, that you and I have to play as mentors and models which will remain. On the other hand, online education provides affordances that perhaps can compensate in some ways. And that's what, what, we, what we will see. This is not a five-year goal. This is a generation-long goal. But the need is such, the sooner we get started, the better off we are. Here is our mission. So this has about 10 academic industrial nonprofit partners headquartered at Georgia Tech. Uh, but the mission here is we'll conduct responsible research in AI that is grounded in theories of human cognition and learning. It must be grounded in theories of human cognition and learning. We are serving humans, human students, human teachers. It has to be grounded in theories of human cognition and learning and derived from the scientific process of learning engineering. So what is the scientific process of learning engineering? It's an iterative process where you start with some theories of learning, you build some tools and educational interventions, you do pilot experiments, and you go back and you revise your tools. You collect data, you format, do formative assessment, you do educational interventions, and you revise your um, tools, your interventions. There's continual improvement. All right, I hope I have given you some idea about what we'll be talking about today. Let's delve into it, let's dig deeper. How can we hope to make online education for adult learning comparable to in-person education? Why would anyone even think of such an aspirational goal? There are two reasons. First, like I mentioned, hypothesis one, we can use AI assistance to personalize learning for adults, and this is a very complicated problem because almost all previous success of AI and personalization has been for well-defined problems like arithmetic. And I already said that adult learners are interested in ill-defined problems. How do we do personalization for ill-defined problems? Second, we know that in online education there are some problems. I'm sure everyone in this room has either taken an online class or has taught an online class or both. According to the Common Ref Inquiry Framework, there are three problems in online education, and you can tell me whether these relate to you. First, there is very little cognitive engagement. You watch videos, hours after videos, hours after videos, and most of the videos that the teachers prepare are not very interesting. Second, the teachers prepare the videos or other digital materials, and they disappear. You have very little interaction with the teacher in online class. There is no teacher presence or very little teacher presence. And third, the class is asynchronous, geographically distributed. There might be 500 students in an online class. You don't know any one of them. There is no social interaction. 
But learning is a social and emotional process, not just a cognitive process. All right, so we know some problems with uh, online education, and we know personalization is a possibility. So I'm going to look at some of these. I don't have the time to look at all of them. So I'm going to begin with teacher presence. So we are examining some hypotheses in our institute about how to enhance teacher presence. Right now, I will discuss with you just one. By using an AI assistant to answer students' questions anytime, any place, any question. So a few years back, we built a virtual teaching assistant that we call Jill Watson. Jill Watson has been working by now uh, since 2016, so for about seven years. More than 10,000 students have used it. More than 200 professors have used Sorry, more than 200 human teaching assistants have used it. More than 40 professors have used it. So we have quite a bit of experience with it. Jill Watson answers, initially answered questions about logistics of a class. When is this project due? What will happen in that particular lab? When do labs start? And it gave answers based on the course syllabi and course description. These are the kind of questions that annoy teachers enormously. Go read in the syllabus. But of course, no one goes and reads the syllabus. Then it started answering questions about content. What is carbon cycle? What is photosynthesis? What is photosynthesis rate? So Jill Watson could answer questions both about logistics of a class at a student's demand. Then suddenly, last year, ChatGPT came along. And so we decided to integrate Jill Watson and ChatGPT. So now Jill Watson is the front end, ChatGPT is the back end, and that has seriously enhanced Jill Watson's conversational capability. Now you can talk to Jill Watson. What is Vera? Vera is a web application. How to access it? Notice this question, how to access it is in fact not good English. But the important thing is that it, the Jill Watson will get the notion of it refers to Vera. Gives an answer. Does it run on Safari? Answer. I ha only have Safari. How to inform the need to add support? Again, poor English. Doesn't matter. It can get at the answer. So now here's the situation. Jill Watson can answer questions about almost anything. It can converse with you anytime, any place. And that is teacher support. I want every teacher in the world to have a Jill Watson. In fact, I want every student in the world to have a Jill Watson. Why shouldn't there be a Jill Watson on your iPhone? So we introduced this combination of Jill Watson and ChatGPT in three online classes this summer. They are actually running. Students are using it right now, even as we speak. These are online classes. And what we have found is that ChatGPT helps make Jill Watson conversational improves its performance in terms of accuracy, precision, recall. But a surprising finding that we did not initially expect. As you know, ChatGPT suffers from fallacies and hallucinations sometimes. Hallucination is a term where it kind of makes up an answer, which is dangerous in learning and education. You would not want to go a class in which a teacher is suffering from hallucinations. What we have found is that when Jill Watson and ChatGPT work together, Jill Watson seems to reduce ChatGPT's hallucinations. Making two AI agents work together, one enhances the capability of another. ChatGPT enhances the capability of Jill Watson. But Jill Watson acts as a check on ChatGPT. And I think that's the future. Now, of course, we have Jill Watson running on course syllabus, learner guides, why not Jill Watson on a textbook? Why not Jill Watson based on a video? In fact, my bet is that within a year, you'll be driving your car, and you'll have textbooks, and you'll be able to talk to them. And why not? OK. Let me now move to human AI interaction. This sounds easy, but it's not because I can ask more questions. Well, if I'm going to use AI teaching assistance for answering questions, how can we scale the development of these teaching assistants? If it takes 100 hours to build a teaching assistant, and it saves a teacher 100 hours to answering questions, but that's not a good trade-off. I want to save a teacher 100 hours in asking questions, but I want these AI assistants to be so easy to build that any teacher can build in the world within an hour. 
how do you do that? That introduces new questions of machine teaching. What is machine teaching? Machine teaching is a new technique where a teacher, any human, can teach a machine so that a machine can teach other machines. I'll show you just a little bit more about that in a second. But that's not enough. I don't want to use an AI assistant that I don't understand. I want the AI assistant to be transparent. I want it to be trustworthy. I want to be able to ask it questions. How did you find this answer? Why should I believe this answer is right? I want the AI assistant to do self-explanation. Again, there's human AI interaction. And not just that, I want this AI assistant to be personalized to me and to you and to all the learners in the world. And that requires some theory of mind of the user. Theory of mind is a construct coming from cognitive science and social sciences, which essentially says that, look, although you and I have not met yet, and I just met Donald and Antonio for the first time today, I have a theory of their mind. I can ascribe a mental state to them. They can ascribe a mental state to me. This theory of mind is the basis of human communication and collaboration. No theory of mind between AI and humans. Why not? So giving you a sense of where I think what is coming down the pipeline. OK, so let's look at self-models. Many of the questions that people ask of AI agents have to do with, what are your goals? How did you come to this particular answer? What knowledge did you use? So we have built agents that have a theory of their own mind. They have, to have a model of themselves. And we have found that these agents, shown on the right here, they have a model of themselves, and they can reason on those models and give answers to questions that humans ask. Right now, we can classify about 85% of the questions that humans ask of their agents correctly. We can answer about three-fourths of the questions correctly. Machine teaching. ChatGPT uses what in AI is called zero-shot learning. We're not getting into zero-shot learning right now, uh, but it makes many mistakes. How then can you build a Jill Watson on top of ChatGPT and make sure that it doesn't make any mistakes? Well, you can ask a human annotator to annotate everything, but that's very costly. Human time is costly. So now we have developed a technique, a machine learning technique, that uses mislabeled example prediction that reduces the cost for human annotation. With just one-sixth of the data, we can get close to 93% accuracy. You don't have to worry about all the technical details here. The important thing is that what is coming down the pipeline is much better human AI interaction where you will be able to teach the machine how to teach someone else. And that's important for democratization of AI. That's important for empowerment of teachers. The power should be with teachers, not with AI researchers like me. And the theory of mind. And a danger here. So we did an experiment. We are now building AI agents that can detect your personality. The personality is a very nebulous concept, so these agents sometimes make mistakes. But when an AI agent makes mistakes, how do humans react to it? And we found something surprising and something disturbing. The surprising thing is in the middle. All of our learners in the first study, there were about 20 of them, were able to form theories of how they think the AI agent works. And they were able to do about half of them by analogy to how they think their mind works. Note what we are doing. We have a theory of how our mind works, and we are ascribing the same theory to AI. So the surprising thing, the disturbing thing is, that even when the AI agent made an in inaccurate judgment, half of the humans in our study were more willing to believe the AI agent than they were willing to, willing to believe themselves. They overtrust AI agents. AI agent is so smart, it has access to all the data, it must be right, I must be wrong. Now, this is dangerous, because it takes power away from humans, it takes agency away from humans. So AI is not a magic, we have to be very, very careful in using AI. The problems are in learning and education, not in AI. So you have a huge role to play to make sure that AI gets used right. Let me go to personalization. 
So the uh, Bloom two sigma effect has been known for about 40 years. What uh, Benjamin Bloom, an educational psychologist, found was that in conventional teaching, if you have a class of 30 students that's shown on the left, uh, red on the left here, then you get some median scores, median means, and so on, some standard deviation. But if you do one-on-one -on -one tutoring for the same subject population, then the scores improve by two standard deviations, hence the name two sigma. So this has been the holy grail in education for about 40 years, for about two generations. But we know the economics is such that we are never going to have one-to-one -one tutoring. That will require too many teachers. So perhaps we can use AI. But AI has succeeded only in well-defined problems. It has not succeeded in open-ended problems yet. But adults are interested in open-ended problems. So we have a dilemma. Moreover, AI has succeeded only in micro-learning, where all the information is coming from within this single episode. Please add 7 plus 4. That's an episode of add addition. And all the data I collect, I can use it to guide learning. But wait, there is data available on all the problems that have been solved, on all the classes someone has taken, data available in the entire lifetime. Why aren't we using it? And that leads to meso learning and macro learning. And that's what we, where we want to go. So let me give you an example. We have built Vera, which is a virtual laboratory, self-directed learning, adults, no teacher in this particular case. And so Vera helps you build models of ecological phenomena, the example that I gave, what will happen to the sea turtles on the east coast of Georgia as the temperature of water rises by one degree. Open-ended problem, no one, has the, no one knows quite the answer. You can build models, you can do simulations, uh, and we have connected with Encyclopedia of Life, which is a library uh, of biodiversity coming from Smithsonian Institution, that's their work, not ours. And by, in turn, Smithsonian Encyclopedia of Life now provides access to Vera. So now, all across the world, people have access to Vera, and thousands of people are using Vera as we speak. OK. So uh, we deployed this in a class in North Georgia Technical College, where class students are learning how to become natural resource manager, uh, managers, how to take care of a fish or a, 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 sorry, of a pond or a lake and so on, or a forest. And instructors of this course unexpectedly use Vera as an assessment tool on final examination. We did not recommend it. But we know that teachers and students are having engagement with AI when they use it in novel ways. And what they found was that 80% of the students passed this examination using Vera on their own and created models that were pretty interesting, complex, variable. But not yet personalization. So now, how can we do personalization? What kinds of help do we need to provide? What kinds of data do we need to collect? Well, help, Encyclopedia of Life. Ask Jill. There's a Jill Watson buried inside Vera, and you can ask Jill Watson questions about Vera. AI coaches, self-explanations. I already talked about self-explanation. Vera can provide explanations about itself, how it found an answer. Let's look at his coaches a little bit more. Well, first, we have to collect a lot of data for these coaches to work. Every click in the Vera environment, every data model created, every simulation, I'm looking at the bottom most row, of every question the learner asks, every learner experience with Vera, but we have this data. This is online education. This data was never available earlier if only we can figure out how to use this data. And that's what we do. We look at this data, we do hierarchical clustering, then we do Markov chain modeling, and then we can start doing personalization. But looking at this data, by people, data collected from people who were using Vera globally, we found that there are just three major kinds of modes. One where people build conceptual models, that's type one, Second way, they will just look at simulations, don't build models. And the third way, they build both models and simulations. And of course, it will not surprise you that the third is the best. That's where the best models get created. So now we know how to build coaches. We want to build coaches that can nudge the learner from an observation mood to an exploration mood, from a simulation mood to a full construction. But that's not enough. 
we really want to use the learner profile. So here are the actions that the user is taking in Vera. Here is all the learning analytics that we are doing on all the actions that the user is taking. This is being done at runtime, so it's in real time. There is external demographics information available about the agent, um, all of the data from his or her lifetime, and all the questions that the agent has asked. And all of that should go into providing feedback and personalization for the learner. That's the challenge. That's the opportunity. OK, so I'm going to uh, come to the end of my talk. First, the impact of AI and learning and education is going to be deep, profound, and systemic. We'll not only do things better, things that we do now, do them slightly better. We'll do much better things that we just don't even do now, because we can't, like personalization. The first impact will be felt in higher education. In K-12 education, there are too many local forces, social, cultural, demographic, political, economic. Within higher education, you're going to see I'm going to make some predictions so that five years later you can say, Ashok, you were wrong about everything. But I have to make some predictions. You're going to see the rise of first AI-powered universities. What AI-powered university? What I mean by AI-powered university is everything in the university is going to be mediated by AI. Every research element, every teaching element, every administrative element. Students will embrace it. Teachers will adapt it. Staff will worry about it. The administration will wait. That's the usual case. It will redefine what higher education means. And these are my main points from the beginning. Education and learning is in our lifetime. You do it, I do it. You will do more of it, I'll do more of it. AI will have a huge impact. Personalization will be the key. But AI is not one thing. And human AI interaction, self-explanation, machine teaching, theory of mind, are the things coming down the pipeline. They're going to have as, as huge an impact as current AI technologies do. And that's what we do at the National AI Institute for Adult Learning and Online Education. Thank you very much. <laughs>